Hello and welcome to Occupied Thoughts, a podcast brought to you by the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I'm Laura Friedman. I'm the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Today is October 18th, 2022, and it is my pleasure to have with me today Cheryl Nestel. Cheryl is a retired sociologist whose teaching and research have been in the area of race and racism. She has been active in Palestine solidarity work for decades, and she serves on the steering committee of Independent Jewish Voices. I'm sorry, she served on the steering committee of Independent Jewish Voices, which is a Canadian organization uh, from 2012 to 2021. And she is the co-chair of that organization's uh, committee entitled No IHRA. Um, Cheryl lives in Israel, Palestine from 1973 to 1988, and she is a founding member of the International Jewish Collective for Justice in Palestine, which is a group of 17 Jewish organizations from 14 countries, which was founded in 2020. So on top of all that, and the reason we're here today, uh, is that Cheryl is also the co-author with Rowan Gaudet, or I may have said that name wrong, I'm sorry if I did, of a new report issued last week by Independent Jewish Voices entitled unveiling the chilly climate, the suppression of speech on Palestine in Canada. And no fears, I will include a link to that report with the notes that accompany this podcast. But if you listen to this podcast, I think you'll have a great framing for digging into this report, which is, it's long, but it is, is well worth the read. So first, Cheryl, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So by way of intro, I'm going to read out loud the very short summary that in, that's included in the the teaser for the report. There's a longer executive summary. I'm not going to read that, but here's the short summary. Okay. IJV has spent the last year gathering research about the repression faced by academics, students, and Palestine solidarity activists, <clears throat> excuse me, collecting approximately 80 testimonies describing the resulting quote unquote chilling effect in Canada. This report is the first of its kind anywhere in the world, utilizing ethnographic methodology and qualitative analysis to describe both the overarching effects of this repression, as well as the deeply personal impact it has on activists, artists, students, and professors. While focused on Canada, it also holds international ramifications as many of the processes we describe are present in other countries." End quote. So, Let's dive in. And actually, before we dive in, um, because I think probably since you are so, so far away, I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., and you are across the globe in, I believe, Toronto. Um, can you introduce yourself briefly to our audience? OK, thanks, Laura. Um, I uh, grew up in California. Uh, I'm a, even though I'm Canadian now, I have three passports, Canadian, Israeli and uh, and uh, U.S. Um, I, many, many, many moons ago, was uh, involved in the radical Jewish student movement, also in the radical left um, in university in the late 60s, early 70s, um, and, and began doing mostly Jewish activism um, in the early 70s, including being the key organizer of the first Jewish feminist conference in North America. Um, working for the um, World Union of Jewish Students uh, at Network. Um, and, uh, and then in the early 70s, I moved to Israel uh, to start a new kibbutz, Kibbutz Gezer. Some people may know about Kibbutz Gezer, which is a mostly American, was mostly an American kibbutz. Uh, left the kibbutz, lived in Israel for 15 years, where I was active politically on the left. Um, came to Canada in, in 1988. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, did a PhD uh, in the sociology of education and taught in the school of the graduate school of education here for 12 years. Uh, and since retiring, um, have been a full-time activist with Independent Jewish Voices Canada. That's the short version. Excellent, excellent. That's a great lead off. So with all of that background in mind, can you just first off start, talk to us about why you and your author and, and IJV uh, want to, to do this research? Why did you undertake this research and this report? And, and maybe also as part of your answer, if you could talk a little bit about IJV's broader work um, around the definition of anti-Semitism, which we call the IRA definition, that's IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism, um, and, and how that's playing out in Canada today. Well, we, uh, first of all, IJV was founded in 2008 um, and has grown exponentially in the last, how many is it, 12 years now? 13, yeah, 14 years. Um, 
And uh, in 2019, the beginning of 2019, it became really apparent to me that the IHRA was going to be an issue of major proportion. Um, so we quickly organized a committee to deal with it. Um, we were pretty much on our own out there. I remember bringing it to people at, at JVP and them saying, I, we don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> you know. Um, so I think one of the things, IJV has been very much in the forefront of the, of the opposition to the IHRA. Uh, we very early on wrote a very long report analyzing the IHRA, put up a website, um, began to educate people on the IHRA uh, with, with webinars, et cetera. Um, I was able to do a few debates with the people from the institutional Jewish community about it, which was sort of unprecedented because they normally don't have us on the same platform. Um, <clears throat> and it managed to, I mean, I think people began to see how, um, how threatening the IHRA was to issues around uh, freedom of expression, uh, suppression of, the, of speech on Palestine, et cetera. Um, and we expanded our, uh, our, you know, our outreach and our, and our uh, campaign. Um, we have a very uh, thorough website, which critiques the IHRA, which follows the, uh, uh, all the incidents that, all the times when IHRA has been used to suppress speech or <clears throat> for other purposes of, of, you know, of basically um, blocking the Palestinian narrative. And, and, and I, I will put a link to that website okay. in the notes as well. Yeah, so it's become a very good reference. I, I think we've become, shall I say, world famous for our activism uh, around the IHRA. Um, and uh, it, it's been a very satisfying um, ride for us in terms of, of putting that out there. We're finding that it's rearing up its ugly head again in what it kind of ebbs and flows, pushes around the IHRA. And right now we're seeing a big push around the IHRA. So we're, you know, we're always having to pivot. We say that we're always, uh, we're playing whack-a-mole all the time because we, we never know when it's gonna pop up and when we're gonna have to try and hit it on the head. So um, we've had a lot of incidents lately that we've had to rush in and, and but because we have the infrastructure in place um, with all, the data that we've collected and the website, et cetera, um, it's been really good. One of the things that I'm most proud of is that we, uh, in the beginning, we didn't, um, we couldn't find partners for this campaign. Um, people in the Palestinian Arab Muslim communities were very afraid of attacks by institutional Jewish groups, Zionist groups, um, and kind of, said to us, we can't get involved in this. Um, as we began to recruit partners, uh, and one of the most important partners has been academics. And one of our biggest, in partnership, we've managed to do way more than we were able to do on our own. And one of our big accomplishments um, was getting the Canadian Association of University Teachers, which represents 70,000 academics in Canada, to unanimously reject the IHRA, uh, which was a huge, a huge uh, accomplishment. So we continue to do that work, and um, you know, whenever the 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 mole pops up, we uh, figure out how to deal with it. So, so with that as background, how how does this report fit in? I mean, you this report takes things to a whole different level, and it's a heavily researched report. We're going to get into the methodology and the content, but what was it that made <clears throat> you and your co-author and IJV want to do this um, report to produce a researched report like this? Well, one of the we know that there have been very well publicized stories of individuals who have been fired. Uh, censured, et cetera, Stephen Salida and, and the attacks on the tenure cases of, of Abu, Ab, sorry, Nadia Abu al Haj, uh, Joseph Massad. I, I could go on and on, Norman Finkelstein, of course. So um, we know many of those cases, they're public cases. What we didn't know was what was going on beneath the surface. So not everyone who you know, who has been, who has had speech on Palestine suppressed has been public about what they have experienced. 
Um, and we, we were concerned with what the possible implications were for particularly faculty and students of the um, you know, application of the IHRA on campuses and in other places. Um, because the threat is, has been very ominous. So it, our first impulse was to say, let's ask people what they're actually doing um, in anticipation of the IHRA being implemented. Um, and as we started to put the research together, we realized there's a lot more going on here. There's a lot more to say. People are doing things that, you know, are not necessarily public and experiencing repression in ways that aren't necessarily worthy, newsworthy, and yet they're very important to the way knowledge is being produced in the academy, to the way students uh, interact with, with um, their professors and with, with uh, campus administration, um, and that there was a story to be told there. So, I mean, one of the things that the chilly climate, you know, appellation for this thing, um, you know, one of the things that we think of when we think of chilly climate is suppression, that it's suppressing something. But in fact, it's actually productive of something. It's productive of a certain kind of speech, a certain kind of speech that, you know, some of the people we quote, the academics that we quote in the, in, in the report call compulsory Zionism. But that is the acceptable discourse in academia is to be pro-Zionist and that to be pro-Palestinian is to be, is to segregate yourself from, from kind of the most civilized discourse and the most acceptable discourse. Um, and we felt that that was a very, you know, concerning uh, dynamic um, and that the suppression of any kind of knowledge production is really anathema to, the, to academia and that we wanted to expose that as well. So we wanted to be exposing many, many things. Um, yeah. but that was one of them. I wanna, I wanna circle back later to what you exposed because I, that's obviously the meat of this story and, and the, the idea of compulsory Zionism is fascinating that, 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 that there's nothing neutral. A chilly climate is not a neutral climate. It's a climate that actually favors the thing that is, that it, it favors a different, a different set of ideas um, or, or pushes them forward. Before we get into that, I want to talk to you. Um, I want you to talk about your methodology a little bit, um, because generally what we've seen, and I'm someone who, who, as you know, obsessively follows the IRA stuff. I've written about it. I've spoken about it for years. And, and I have to say IJV's work here was prescient um, and has been invaluable, very much of a lighthouse for, for all of us working on this. Um, but most of the work we've seen done until now is essentially analysis, op-eds, essays, which find you know an example here and there, you know, to to illustrate the ideas that we're writing about. I've done this. Um, talk about what the how this is different in terms of methodology. And and you know, for those of us who are not academics, unpack what things mean like eth ethno ethnographic methodology. I mean, I could use some help understanding exactly what you mean by those terms. Um, I think basically what we're getting at with that you know, description is that we're digging very deeply into people's experiences, but also putting them into the context in which these experiences are happening. And that's extremely important. So it's not just that people are feeling this, that, or the other thing. Uh, it's that they're feeling that in response to an organized set of practices um, and that you need to have both of those things. And of course, I mean, Methodologically, this is a you know a social justice project. So this isn't meant to be neutral in any way, shape, or form. The people we interviewed were not randomly selected. They were people who are either activists or known for their pause, you know, their their expression of solidarity with Palestinian human rights. Um, so it, it's not at all neutral. Uh, I think that's one of the the basic. Uh, uh, you know, underpinnings of, of liberatory knowledge production. Um, and of course, one of the other uh, aspects of this is that we have taken into consideration the social hierarchies of gender, race, sexuality, uh, you know, it's and citizenship into what we do. So these are not neutral, you know, um, respondents. Everyone, we've tried to situate each one in terms of their 
place in, in a social hierarchy in order to understand how different people respond differently, are targeted differently, um, and have different, um, you know, different skin in the game, let's say, uh, in this picture. So trying to get at a whole bunch of different levels. And I think that the one of the things we do in the report, and I was one of my friends said to me, we listed all the incidents, like we 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 went through uh, what's going on in Europe now, to some extent, what's going on in the States, what has gone on in the States, and tried tried to be very, very specific about Canada and what's been going on in Canada. So uh, one of my readers, one of my friends said to me, you know, this is just onerous to have to read through this stuff. It's Let's move it to the back, you know, we'll put it in an addendum. I said, no, no, no. I want people to actually have to confront this. So I want them to see this before they read the individual experiences. So they know that the individuals that we interviewed are part of a much larger picture here. And, and a picture that goes from the worst litigation and harassment and violence to just self, self censorship and silencing. So, you know, you really need to get the whole picture. And I think that's what an ethnographic methodology um, allows you to do. I will say, I, I think it's extraordinarily effective. Um, there is a, I think, a tendency for people who are unfamiliar with this material, I mean, in terms of they haven't been following it for years or they're hostile to it, to want to dismiss. They're gonna dismiss an analytical statement that this is what is happening. And if you bring you know, one example from the media, they'll say, well, that's a, that's a one-off and there's a bigger story. I think what you do quite effectively with this research method, with the number of cases you bring up and the way you center them in the discussion is you make it much harder for people to simply dismiss this as something that isn't happening and that's being misrepresented. I mean, they still may not agree with all the conclusions or any of the conclusions, but the reality of what's, what's going on is I think incontrovertible. And I think you your methodology establishes that enormously well, effectively. Um, so now I want to circle back to the conclusions, which I guess maybe is the fun part um, or the not fun part. Um, so, so, I mean, I don't want to ask you like the, the silly question people ask a researcher after completing decades of work, but hey, what was the most interesting and important things that you came up with? I mean, that's the obvious thing. Interesting, important. And then the other one, and one of my colleagues asked me to ask you this, what surprised you? Um, and, and by surprising, I would add, is, surprised you, did you find something that was surprising or did you not find something you're expecting to find as someone you, you've been immersed in this for so long? I don't think I found anything very surprising there, um, mainly because I'm constantly in conversation with, with pe people that we interviewed and those like them. Um, so the story, I mean, one of the things that prompted us to do the work is that we've been hearing these stories for so long, we wanted to in some way document them and record them and make sure that they were available. Um, and also because many of these people are unable to be public about what they do. So making a place where people can be public without being identified was really, really important because that, you know, it's almost the point of our work is that, is that people have to hide their opinions and their activities and, you know, change directions in their research because they're told that, you know, they're gonna, flop academically if they write about Palestine. And that was a really um, prominent um, theme throughout this, that people were being were told by their colleagues, you know, by their supervisors, by their chair, you know, you can't, you, not that you, we think it's bad that you do this, but it's gonna wreck your career if you do this. Nobody's gonna hire you. Nobody's gonna be your supervisor. Nobody's gonna vouch for you. Um, so of course people, you know, becoming an academic is a long arduous process and people want to succeed at it. They don't want to fail at it after that kind of effort. So being told that they shouldn't pursue a particular uh, path um, can be a very powerful uh, message. So I, I think that that was, I wouldn't say it's surprising to me, but the impact that it had on people who I consider, you know, very, you know, out about their politics and very aggressive about their politics was pretty surprising. People saying, oh my, you know, I was told this and I just thought 10 times before I wrote about Palestine or, you know, made, created another research project around Palestine. So yeah, that was, 
that was surprising and very disturbing, I think. I mean, I think, and to me, I go back to this notion of, of, of the ability to produce knowledge. I mean, we know how you know, aggressively the Palestinian narrative has been suppressed for such a very, very long time. And to see how it's happening right now in real time is, is very upsetting um, and, and what's causing it. Um, yeah, I, I think that another surprising, it's not surprising because I follow it so closely, but the extent to which the pro-Israel Jewish organizations um, are organized to suppress and impede um, and silence and accuse is pretty stunning. Because um, many of them present themselves as sort of human rights or neutral pro-Jewish, you know, communally, community building organizations. And yet you see the, the number of resources that they pour into the activity of suppressing speech on Palestine. So that I think when you see it all in one place, you know, listed, it becomes quite um, disturbing and stunning. And we I think one of the questions we need to ask ourselves, and I have to say is my activism has always been around influencing the Jewish community. Um, you know, I, I'm all very involved in Palestine solidarity work, but it's most usually in trying to move Jews from, you know, a, a, an uncritical pro-Israel position to a more critical position and thinking about the health of Jewish life and how it has been so deeply, deeply rotted by this adherence to the Zionist story and to what Israel thinks should be done outside of its borders. So <laughs> I think that those, you know, seeing the, <clears throat> the, you know, the extent to which the institutional Jewish community is influencing things um, is pretty stunning. So I, I want to pick up on a couple of things there. And for folks who are listening, I mean, I think we, we haven't quite maybe made explicit that when we talk about chilling, we mentioned the IRA definition before. And you talk about the, the the quashing of the Palestinian narrative that what we're talking about today, modern times, <laughs> the, the, the 2022s, um, is the actual treatment of effectively the entire Palestinian lived historic narrative as being anti-Semitic under the IRA definition, because it will be claimed they are denying the right of self-determination to the Jews or criticism of Israel, particularly anti-Zionism or criticism of the very state that this kind of state that Israel is, is seen as um, different kind of criticism than you'd have against other countries or whatever. They, they look to the IRA definition to effectively delegitimize and suppress almost um, any form of the Palestinian uh, narrative and support for Palestinian rights. So just to make that clear connection using the anti-Semitism piece as the hook, which is very clear, obviously, in the report. Um, but I want to I want to focus on that for a second. Um, and and something we're seeing in the U.S. I know we've seen in Canada, uh, probably sooner and 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 at least as intensely is this debate. I will call it hysteria, histrionics around anti-Semitism on, on campus, um, and the claims which are very much at the base of a lot of the chilling. The claims that anti-Semitism is running rampant on campuses and among you know woke faculty members and that Jewish students on campus are living in terror because for them um, being denied the primacy of Israel and having Israel um, you know, be out there and, and immune to criticism is part of their Jewish identity. So what did your research find with respect to these kinds of allegations? Well, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't talk, the only Jewish students we talked to were ones who were Palestinian solidarity activists. So they're gonna have a very different take on this. But let me say this about that. Um, I follow very closely the academic and organizational literature about students and anti-Zionism and harassment on campus. And there've been a couple of brand new reports, the ADL just put out a report on anti-Israel, not anti-Semitic, anti-Israel activities on campus. Um, and I. I had my notes somewhere, I can't find them, but the um, apparently they, they document 340 incidents 
Um, and 300 of them had to do with, uh, you know, basically uh, organizational events on campus or demonstrations. So we know the content of those things. Those, those don't constitute harassment of Jewish students as Jewish students. They are political events. So they're now calling even political events on campus uh, anti-Semitic if they are pro-Palestine. Um, one of the things I can say about these reports that I follow in the academic research is that much of it is, is very poor. <laughs> it's very poor methodologically uh, in my estimation. So, you know, the, 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 the pool of interviewees is usually Hillel members or Jewish fraternity and sorority members. So people who are very committed to the Zionist narrative, <clears throat> who are likely active on campus and will encounter hostility. Um, but there are actually, I think, an interesting number of, of research um, studies that show that students are not actually feeling what it's being claimed that they feel. They don't feel under siege. They don't necessarily feel um, attacked. But there's another aspect to this that relates to what we've done. And that is that the, the I don't want to claim at all that there is no anti-Semitism on campuses, that students don't experience anti-Semitism. There's some really egregious stuff that's happened here in Canada. And I think we need to listen to that and not blow it off as being, you know, people making things up or whatever. Um, but they don't face a concerted, funded, organized campaign in the same way as Palestine solidarity activists do. It, that's a very different kettle of fish than somebody knocking your kippah off your head. Having, you know, in, here in Ontario where I live, uh, Hillel has a budget of $4 million in the province. That will buy you a lot of, you know, pro-Israel campus advisors and um, events, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there is no funding that even begins to match that on the other side. So let's be very clear about um, you know, where harassment comes from on their side and where harassment comes from on the side of, of Palestine human rights activists. So um, I think that's really key, but I'll, I have to say the methodology, whenever many of these things I read, I think this is, and, and the, at the heart of it, as you mentioned, Laura, it's the definition of anti-Semitism. So what definition are they using when they ask students if they have experienced anti-Semitism. So if their experience of anti-Semitism is seeing a Palestinian flag flying on campus, you know, I, I think that we have a lot of uh, material to debate whether or not that's anti-Semitism. And it does get back to the IHRA definition again, which is being used. I mean, some of these studies um, say that they use the IHRA as methodology that that's their measure of anti-Semitism. So of course, political activity on campus that's pro-Palestine is gonna be counted as anti-Semitism. And therefore, because we've seen, you know, an expansion of activism on campus, then the perception of anti-Semitism on the parts of those who think that that's anti-Semitic is going to be enormous. So there's a lot to unpack here. I'm thinking, Maybe I should write an article where I review all of these these studies and say, you know, let's uh, this hysteria is really not warranted. Yeah, I'm I'm smiling as I'm listening to you. I'm remembering, I think it was last year, maybe the year before, a group called the Amcha Initiative, so a religious right wing group, had a report on antisemitism on campus, and they, they literally said it, it was funny reading. Like they said that classic antisemitism, we know it, is down on campus based on polling. But the new anti-Semitism is up, which means criticism of Israel using the IRA definition. And then they just sort of put that out front at the beginning of the report. And then they just refer to the massive rise in anti-Semitism, which is only, they've already said the hatred of Jews because they are Jews thing is actually down. But then the headlines are, you know, surging anti-Semitism. Um, so I wanna come back to sort of broader questions. Um, and feel free to, if I've forgotten to ask you something about the report itself, please jump in and, and, and answer whatever I didn't ask. Um, but I wanna ask you a little bit about, so just 
something I thought about when I saw the report. So Palestinians have been raising the issue of the chilling of free speech for a very long time. Um, and I, I want to ask to what extent does it matter that IJV is a Jewish group putting out this report? Does it matter? Um, is it is it something that is um, that is is it is it is that, how is this viewed by Palestinian allies and partners that a Jewish group is putting out this report and 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 framing it in in the terms you're framing it in? Um, well, we've had nothing but positive responses from our Palestinian allies, and we work very closely with Palestinian activists uh, and academics here in Canada. Um, I haven't heard one bit of criticism about the fact that a Jewish group is doing it. Because for one thing, IJV has been doing this kind of work for a really long time and sees it as our responsibility as Jews. So, um, so you're not just dropping in and doing this. You've built relationships, you've built credibility and yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've had, we had Palestinian readers, we've had, yeah, there, we do this in, concert with our allies always. Um, and we do it for our allies, right? I mean, there is a way in which, to my great, you know, regret, the Jewish voice is heard more loudly than the Palestinian voice um, when it comes to these issues. Um, people will look to, G I mean, mistakenly look to Jews, you know, to verify what Palestinians have been saying for decades and decades and decades. So I don't, want to say that we jump on that bandwagon, but we had the opportunity and the option to do this. Um, and we felt like it was it would make an important contribution. Um, for, so for example, we're, we're probably going to be work, we have, there are two other reports that have come out of Canada that are really important. One is a report from the Arab Canadian Lawyers Association on anti-Palestinian racism, which has also made the rounds um, and is extremely useful. And we are, of course, you know, partnered with them on many, many uh, uh, activities. Uh, and then there's a, a report that just came out written by my friend, Jasmine Zine, who's a professor of sociology, um, which is on the Islamophobia industry in Canada. Um, so, you know, we, we've been talking about how can we come together um, to talk about our work uh, in ways that reinforce each other. So that's, you know, one of the things that that we think is really, really important. Um, I, I think we just had the will and the opportunity to do this um, and, and wanted to. And I think that's, that comes from building solidarity. I mean, we didn't, we couldn't have done this. We couldn't have recruited the, the you know, 77 people we did without having done the work that we've done for the last 14 years. Uh, people, I think, trusted us with their stories. Uh, they might not have trusted some random university uh, researcher, but they trusted a group that had proven that they really were allies to Palestinians uh, in this fight. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's the answer. Yeah, no, that's a that's a powerful answer. And for anyone who's listening, I am going to hunt down those two reports that Cheryl just mentioned, and I will put them in the notes because <laughs> I want to read them. Yeah. Um, so I want to. I have two more questions. I'm actually going to combine them. And, and anything else you want to add? So, first of all, who is the audience, or who are the audiences (plural) for this report? As we said, IJV is a Canadian organization. The report focuses on Canada but also touches on Europe and the US. You know, who do you hope will read it? Um, and, and what do you hope the report will accomplish? You clearly put a lot of time and a lot of work. This is a heavily researched, really, really, um, I mean, this is like peer review stuff. Um, it's an excellent, excellent, deeply researched report. So what do you hope it's gonna accomplish? Um, okay, I'll, I'll just start by saying it has to be, it had to be that deeply researched because whenever people on our side of the equation do this kind of work, it has to be, I would say, almost perfect and unassailable um, because it will be attacked. So you wanna make it as solid as it possibly can be. Um, and that's, you know, that's the impetus behind the amount of work that was put into it. Um, the audience, uh, first of all, this suppression of speech on Palestine, as you well know, Laura, because you documented, you know, all the time, is a transnational phenomenon. So it's happening. I think Great Britain has been one of the worst cases. Germany is really bad. 
really bad. I mean, maybe the worst. Um, and and we've had because we have lots of international partners, we have been able to disseminate it internationally, which is really really great. Um, and uh, so I think that the readership we're looking for is a very broad readership. So we're looking for academics to read it. We want to put a copy on the desk of every Canadian university president uh, in every um, diversity, equity, and inclusion office in, in, at universities, um, because we know that the Zionist groups are heavily lob lobbying both the DEI people and the administrations of universities. So we want to disrupt that narrative that Jews are being excluded, et cetera, et cetera. Although frankly, there, they have, there is a point there that there, that people, I think these offices, this equity, uh, the equity industry does need to take Jews more seriously and listen to what they're saying. It doesn't mean that every claim is one that needs to be acted on, et cetera. Um, but so I think that those are really important audiences for us. Well, and it's uh, also, I say it's, it's helping them, I would think, understand the distinction between what are genuinely Jewish equity challenges and what is a political debate being reframed as a Jewish identity equity challenge in order to quash free speech. I mean, that's, that's the essence of the entire report, really. Absolutely. And one of the things that we do and I do is we've developed an anti-Semitism training called an anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-Semitism training module that we have been trying, we've been doing it at several universities for student councils and um, some diversity officers um, and hoping to expand that. We're just training some more people to do that now because there needs to be education around anti-Semitism that does not contain, you know, the element of criticism of Israel as anti-Semitic. Um, and talking about why that shouldn't be. So um, there's a big project here, right? That, you know, this is part of our big project um, to really change that. But, but you know, again, without discounting that there's anti-Semitism, I mean, we just, you know, this week has been a big week for anti-Semitism with Trump and, you know, and, and Mehdi Hassan's intervention on MSNBC and, you know, so many of the interesting the commentary that we've seen everywhere so um yeah we can't dismiss it but we have to be realistic about what it is otherwise i mean the threat is that if you concentrate on criticism of israel as anti-semitic you're going to miss where it's really happening and we know there are honestly there are so many studies now that have come out very recently showing that anti-semitism on the you know nationalist right on the white supremacist right, that's where it's happening. It's not happening on the left, um, you know. And there's some really solid studies that have come out recently about that. Um, well, and and I mean, Donald Trump this week did obviously today is October 18th. Donald Trump this week made this clearer than anyone could have ever asked, right? And it's not the first time he has. I mean, he is almost unable to talk about his support for Israel without being effectively anti-Semitic. He just, people say, oh, it's okay, it's philo-Semitism. And let's remember, remind people, philo-Semitism is just a different kind of anti-Semitism, right? It's fetishizing Israel while actually, you know, hating Jews who don't join you in that political view. Um, and that's what's on display this week. <laughs> So. Yeah, this week. <laughs> Who knows what next week will bring? Um, so, so those are the some of the audiences. It'll be interesting to see how it. So the other thing that we have already been approached about, and was something that I had thought about as well, was we would like to see people replicate this. We would like to see there. There, I think Neve Gordon in the UK is already doing something along those lines, um, and there's some talk of getting the Middle East Studies Association to actually uh, begin to replicate this. Um, so, you know, we're not proprietary about what we've done. We're happy to share everything, our questions, our methodology, all of the technical stuff that we were able to do um, to help this be more widely um, studied. So I, that, that's, another, that's another place we wanna go with this. Um, and, and, that is, and that'll say is a tremendous contribution. Um, the, the report itself, and as someone who is a consumer and will be using it, the number of times over the past 
10 years when I've been trying to explain to people the dangers of the IRA definition. And they say, well, show me proof, show me examples, show me in real life. And, and you know, one of the challenges, like, you know, we're telling you it's going to happen. It's like saying that if you don't fix your car, it's going to break down, but you're not going to believe me until you're in the middle of the desert, your car is broken down, is an intellectually um, problematic approach to proof. Um, but, you know, as we come up with, you know, well, here's an example from Germany, here's an example from France, what you've actually provided is a much more thorough answer. Here is a case study of what it looks like when this is implemented and what it means for free thinking, for free speech, for, for academics. So, I mean, I think it's, it's an incredibly um, welcome and powerful uh, tool for all of us working in this space. So thank you for that. Thank you for the compliment, yeah. Yeah, we have a case coming up now. We have another a new fight here where the Canadian government, because of a single verifiably anti-Semitic uh, uh, person who was funded by one of the government programs, um, was discovered to have tweeted many horrible anti-Semitic things. So now the government wants to implement um, uh, a policy whereby everybody who gets government funding for these kind for projects of various sorts has to affirm um, basically the IHRA that they would adhere to the IHRA, which has been adopted by the Canadian government. And the implication of this are enormous. I can't even begin to tell you how scary it is. So, I mean, at least we have this evidence here that you know we're this is a really in a democratic society this should not be happening where people have to swear allegiance to israel before they can get funds for research or for community involvement projects etc cetera, etc cetera. so the canadian government is just like coming out you know all guns blazing uh lately on the ihra and um it's, you know, we have to renew our uh, commitment to, to fighting it. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's very much what we are um, going to be facing in the short term in the US. We've seen uh, new projects from some of the major legacy Jewish organizations, which put promoting the IRA definition at a, as a whole of government approach in every aspect. A whole of government, I think, basically means what you're saying, yeah. um, linking it to government funding, to government programs, um, and then, you know, it just, it goes from there, and we've already seen it added to hate crimes laws in a few states, and, you know, the the, the legislating is part of curriculum, so this is, this is not a, this is not a short-term project, and I think I will, I will answer partly in terms of the, the, what this report will accomplish. I think this report is going to be a really, really um, powerful um weapon for a lot of us pushing back against these kinds of attacks. And I, I hope that other people do emulate it. Um, I think you, you've created a really a really strong model for what it looks like to evaluate and record what's going on. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, any last words before we close down this webinar podcast? I, I think we've done a pretty good job of covering it. Um, <clears throat> please, please read the report. Please disseminate it. Uh, those of you who will you know, find the URL and the and the, and the report uh, after Laura uh, puts it up. Um, yeah, we're just happy. I'm really happy to have it behind me. It was huge. It took us 18 months to write. Um, it was a big, big job. Um, and I'm really, really happy to see it have an, an afterlife. And we're going to be talking about how to promote it further and, and give it a bigger afterlife uh, in the next little while. It's a problem, I, I think I'll just say one thing and that is that we see more and more that organizations are publishing their own research. That, you know, the, the, the paths to publication are very long and convoluted. So, you know, people said, oh, you gotta have, I mean, uh, you know, almost Goldberg said to me, you need to write a, you know, a journal article from this, which we may, we may yet do. Um, but you know these things take forever, and these are timely interventions that that need to be taken up as soon as possible. So I, I see more and more organizations, certainly Palestine Legal, I mean, every organization publishes their own research, and I think this is a path that we have to promote and that we have to endorse, and we have to fund if we if we can. This 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 was done in a complete shoestring. This is like, you know, cause I'm retired, I could, you know, give my time and, you know, just a very, very small amount of money. Um, but I think that we need to, our movement needs to think more seriously 
about um, becoming, you know, a research uh, producing movement, um, and we need to do it well. Um, and and you know, I mean, this isn't going to move everyone. You know, a hundred page report isn't going to move everyone in in the right direction. But I think that we need as much, you know, we need as many resources as we can possibly get to to move things forward. I think that's it. I think you make very strong points, and I, I heartily agree. Um, so we're going to stop there. Um, Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me today, for giving me so much time, and thank you for your work. Uh, we will all be better for it. Uh, for our audience, thank you for listening or watching, whichever is the case. And uh, you can follow Cheryl on Twitter, um, at Cheryl Nestel, S-H-E-R-Y-L-N-S-T. T E L. You can also follow IJV, Independent Jewish Voices. It's at and then I N D Jewish Voices. I'll have all of this in the notes and I'll put in the notes links to the IJV report and I'll put links to all the other reports that were mentioned and some other things that I think are cool and relevant. Um, so check back for that. Finally, as always, I want to remind people subscribe to the Occupied Thoughts podcast. You can do that on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Spotify. And that way you won't miss any of the great content that we're posting pretty much every week at this point. And you can also find the podcast and the video of this podcast at our website, www.fmep.org. So with that, we're going to end it here. I'm Lara Friedman, president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace, signing off until the next episode of Occupied Thoughts.